So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Alain, really happy to be here and uh, honored to be the last keynote speaker of this amazing event. And uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Sergey and the rest of the gang for organizing such an amazing event. And um, today I'm going to talk about uh, boom performance. Uh, before I begin, a little bit about myself. So I've been coding since ever I remember myself, since the age of 8 or 9. Currently I'm co-founder and CDO at The Pulse, and before that I co-founded and uh, was R&D manager at Como, also known as uh, Conduit Mobile. And this is my email, and uh, the guy at the conference told me not to say that we're hiring, so I'm not going to say that, but uh, this is my email. You know, if I, uh, so at this point, you're probably wondering what is Boom performance. So when we talk about web performance, we got fast, we got super fast, we got super duper fast, and we got boom. Should be a sound effect to that, so uh, let's try it again. Uh, sound, uh, sound in uh, at the back. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what, what is boom? Boom basically, this is how we say it in the office, boom is the time it takes to say boom, which is really fast. Try to say it, boom. Yeah, that was really fast. And, and if I want to put it into numbers, so we, be, so we are developers here. So when you wait for something to happen on the web, and uh, you wait for 10 seconds, you get this odd feeling that something is not working. Yeah, you wait and you wait. Okay, maybe it's not working. Okay, it works. So, 10 seconds to the user, it feels like it doesn't work. And if the user presses something on your website and you wait for more than one second, what happens is that you have a mental context loop. You start to think about his family, his, his <laughs> wife, other things he needs to do. And if you wait something between 300 and one second, you think that something is working, the machine is working, that's, that's fine. If it's waiting up, up to 300 milliseconds, that's a small delay. You know, it can, it can deal with it, but it still feels like a delay. But if something happens between 0 and 100 milliseconds, it feels instant, which we call the boom effect. And I want to focus on that in my presentation. Why is boom important? Well, why am I talking about this subject? First of all, speed affects your product. And you guys should probably know this already. And trust me, you don't know that your product is slow. I mean, your users will use it, some people might complain, but deep down inside, they feel that something is not working. When you achieve boom speed, people will use the product more. Let's see an example of a small company called Google. So you use Google, and you know in your mind, Google is really fast. Whenever you search something on Google, you know you get the results instantly. And because it's so fast, I personally use it for spell, as a spell checker because I can type anything and in the middle of milliseconds I'm going to get the right way to spell it. And because it's so fast, I even use it to calculate uh, any, any math you want to do. It's faster to me to do it on Google rather than to open a native app and do it on my computer because I know Google is really fast and it's already open on a tab of my computer. When you achieve boom speed, your UI will be simpler. How many times have you heard requests for users saying, oh, can you move this button to the main screen? Maybe you can add this UI. And they ask for this feature not because they think it's going to improve your product, but because the product is slow. Once your product is slow, people will ask, it, will ask to add more buttons to certain pages, which will make your UI more condensed, and you make your product worse. When you achieve boom addiction, when you achieve boom performance, you create addiction to your product. If it's boom, people will use it for everything. Uh, everything a product can do. If it's fast enough, they'll use it because it solves a pain. It does something for them. But if it's not fast enough, they're going to say, OK, it does something for me, but why are they making me use this shit? And you all know what I'm talking about. You know, product, I'm not going to mention in name, but you know, stuff like Salesforce and Jira, all the sort of stuff that you have to work with, but every time you use it, in your mind, you think, oh, why is it so slow? I think the main point here is investing speed. 
it's one of the best things that you can spend your time on. And always remember, when you create a new killer feature, it's going to serve 10 percent of the users. But if you improve the performance of your product, it's going to serve everyone that uses your product. And speed is something you guys should be in charge of. Because the product guy is going to ask, oh, can you make this faster? Can you make this work faster? And don't know what, how to do it. You guys know what's happening on the client, what's happening on the server, and you guys can improve the performance of the product. So now we know what is Google performance and why it's important. Let's see how we can achieve Google performance. So I'll start with the basics. I'm not going to focus on that because I see you guys are pros. Uh, most of you guys know the basic techniques. I'm just going to go through that to make sure we're all on the same page. So you know, we got the, the general checklist that we need to do. Minify uh, JavaScript and CSS. Uh, use GZIP compression. Optimize images, etc. Use a CDN. Obviously, if you don't use a CDN, you know you're in the wrong profession. Uh, prioritize visible content, JS and CSS. Remove render blocking, uh, JavaScript, move to the bottom of the HTML, anything that you know, prevents the page from rendering. So we all know this basic stuff. But you know, me, me as a team leader, as a developer, I see people uh, shoot themselves in the foot too often. What, what that means is that people use libraries such as jQuery, Jeff, Zepto, Angular, Backbone, it doesn't matter how modern the technology is. If you don't understand what's going on inside the engine, you might uh, cause yourself a performance penalty. So in this little example, you can see a certain loop going on, and uh, I'm performing some sort of a uh, jQuery um, query in here. And what's happening in red, which looks pretty innocent, just one line of jQuery code, basically what happens inside jQuery is that it goes through the entire uh, DOM element and searches for that specific object inside the DOM. Now, if you do it for every iteration of your loop, that's going to be really slow. So, I mean, the obvious solution here is to move that outside, and that's going to do the performance. Sometimes you can do it, sometimes you don't. But I often see people, you know, writing code like that, not using an ID, uh, even using a class. So that's every for every single line, jQuery is going to go through the entire DOM and search for that element and then apply the CSS style, the HTML, and whatever you want to do. Obviously, you can do it by um, adding multiple functions to the element or caching uh, your jQuery results. But this is just one example. Obviously, you know, there's many other ways you can uh, cause damage with jQuery or Backbone or Angular. But I think my point here is that you need to understand what's going on with the library that you're using. Always make sure that your DOM is not heavy. I mean, we talked about the aspects of making your page all explode faster, but you also want to make sure that the user experience in your web page is good enough. I think the ground rule here is to keep 60 frames per second uh, when the user scroll. So try to use with caution anything uh, that involves round corners, box shadow, positive. We all love them. They look beautiful, but it makes your page slow. No matter how beautiful the page is, if it's slow, it's crap. You aware of buying these scroll events. Uh, scroll events are evil. Unless you must use scroll events, don't buy them. Avoid using too many elements. Uh, I mean, you guys probably know this phenomenon. Uh, you guys subdivide HTML, you create a div inside, you create another div, you create a span, you create an href inside, and then you need to think to yourself, why am I making so many elements? Try to minimize the amount of elements. And another nice trick some of you might know is use the GPU. Uh, all the modern browsers, even IE, uh, support the GPU right now, the graphical uh, processing unit. And basically, what it does is that the browser uses the computer or your smartphone uh, graphic processing unit in order to render the HTML page. So in this little example, you can see the same exact code on the left-hand side and right-hand side. Same CSS, only difference is the uh, bottom line where I force uh, the browser to use the GPU. By using Translate 3D, I trick the browser to think this is a 3D animation, and then it moves the images into the GPU, and the rendering is much, much faster. So this is one way you can leverage your browser rendering mechanism, if you understand it, in order to achieve performance. So this was you know, covering the basic. I went through that quite quickly. And now I want to cover other stuff. Uh, it's going to increase and create a boom performance effect to your product. One way to achieve it is using optimistic actions. What is optimistic actions? So let's see one example. You all know Instagram. When you take a photo on Instagram, 
What happens next is the following. First of all, you use the filter. You select the filter that you want to do. And then you uh, select what you want to show. Do you want to show it on Facebook, or Twitter, etc.? And then you need to write down the, your caption, you know, something funny or whatever you want to do. And then it appears on your uh, Instagram feed. Now, what most of us will probably do as a developer is to start uploading the image here. I mean, we got a photo, we got the caption, we got the, the user preferences to how to share this image, and then we start uploading the images. But a cool thing that Instagram has done is that they started uploading the image here because they knew that the user is going to take a few seconds between the moment you took the photo and after if, and, and the time you're going to take it to fill out all the details. Now, what happened was that once the user filled in all the details and, and all these uh, selections, the photo appeared instantly on the Instagram feed. So the user there had that wow effect. Wow, I took this photo on mobile and it appeared in my feed in a matter of milliseconds. So obviously there's some loss in here because, you know, some images, some users won't finish this uh, flow and some images will be uploaded to Instagram server without any use. But think about the user experience. Think about users that they get result instantly. One one piece of software which took this into another level is Facebook. Facebook is using a lot of optimistic actions uh, in the web app. Whatever you do on Facebook, whether you like something, comment on something, watch and reply, is using optimistic actions. Let's see this quick video we created. So in this video, I'm going through the You've Got A Lot of Contents page and I click on Like. You see the UI changes in a, in a matter of grey seconds, but the server is still working. Again, great reply, server is still working, and Basically, what Facebook does here is to render the UI first and then go out to the server. They assume it's going to be successful. So I try to see what happens without the internet. Again, going to Facebook, and you see there's no internet connection. Click on like, it goes back, tries to, to change it to unlike, goes back to like. I try to write the comment, and basically I write a comment, and then Facebook shows me a small indication that it didn't post. So this, is, this was mind-blowing for me, because me as a developer, I am used to do, you know, create a, a, a set network request, do an edit. How many people, you know, wrote, wrote this line of code, whether it's jQuery or Backbone or Angular, I mean, we all used to write this piece of code. We go to the server, wait for success, wait for error, wait, usually on error we pop up a small alert window saying something went wrong. And basically what happened in here is that we take the success part and move it up there. We assume that the server uh, request will be successful, and instead of waiting for the server to return the success, we first render the new UI. And this gives an amazing experience to the user. It does something, and in a matter of milliseconds, the UI changes. What happens behind the scenes? It doesn't care about it. All he cares about is that his user interface changes instantly. Uh, we also try to do it in the box. Uh, so this is our sign-up form, and we just recently changed our sign-up form and wanted it to be super fast. We don't, didn't want to lose any users to try to sign up. So the first stage and the last stage were pretty easy. We just asked the user for information. We've done it all on time inside code, no page rendering or anything. So these were quite easy. We just asked for uh, the name of the company, the name of the person, and so on. But the second part was tricky because we asked the user to select a subdomain. Now, this has to be unique, because you need to catch a subdomain that nobody else is using. And we didn't want to create an experience where you type in a subdomain, click on next, the you know, computer is thinking, saying, okay, this is taken, try again. Okay, try another one, this is taken, try again. And then, once you find something, you need to click on next and find uh, a proper subdomain. So what we've done is that while we wait for, while the user is typing, we go out to the server for every keystroke. And we check if this subdomain is available or not. If it's not available, in the millisecond that he moves his mouse outside of the input box, we show a small uh, message saying this is already taken. And if it's not taken, it's available, he clicks on next, and then he moves instantly to the next page. Now, it's a small change. It's something that happens behind the scene. The user is not aware. But what happened was that this process improved our conversion rate of the sign up over 7 or 8%. And even more important than that, People had a wow effect. They say that our sign up uh, process is smooth, is fast. You know this feeling that when you sign up to products or when you use products, you just have this inner feeling that, wow, this product is amazing, it's smooth, it's super fast. And this is what we try to execute. 
I think that the message here about fitting this method is to think positive. If you know the expected results on the client, just render it. And you guys, if you, if you go home tomorrow, uh, uh, if you go home today, go to work tomorrow, and go through a product and scan it, I can assure you that most of the actions that your product does, you know what the outcome uh, will be. Just render it in the time. So whatever you know the result will be, render it in the time. And if it fails, instead of showing any fancy error messages or anything like that, so either roll back to the previous state or show a small uh, error message saying that something went wrong. Another way to achieve uh, boom performance is to use action prediction. Action prediction is the whole art of predicting your users, preloading any information, and so on. Uh, one way to do it, which was introduced in HTML5, is to use prefetch, pre-render, and reconnect. Think about the following scenario. You got someone visiting your website, signing up, put in his email, and then there's a whole process of him going to his email client, approving the email, and so on. This is a precious time for you guys. You can, do, uh, you can use prefetch and pre-render to render your sign form, to render your system. Think about it. The user goes to an email, in the meanwhile, his browser is working, download any HTML files, any CSS files, any JavaScript files that he's going to need. Once he clicks on the email, boom, the screen shows instantly. Everything is cached, it doesn't have to load anything, and you get an amazing feeling as a user. Always think about that, that your users are predictable. They're probably going to do the same searches and selections 80% of the time. So the method here is that you need to predict the users. How? First, track what they're doing. If, if your user is searching something on your product, selecting something over and over again, just track that. Preload that in the client the next time he logs in, and just as you history will be this up. The user is going to make the same search and selection all over again. And then you're going to achieve user happiness. Some plugins that you can use is Twitter type head. It's an amazing library. And basically, Twitter type head is a combination between client-side results and server-side results. So if you know the user is searching for the same things over and over again, cache it in the client. This is a demo I've made. I type in O. You see, I get results in milliseconds, and then the rest of the results I get from the server. So most of the users, uh, they're gonna, uh, the first few results will be enough for them. They're going to choose them, and they're not going to wait for the server to respond. So this is an amazing way to get uh, boom performance. So I've mentioned type ahead. Lunar is an amazing library. If you guys are using search in your product, if you're using Elasticsearch or Solar, Lunar is a client-side search engine which has most of the capabilities that um, Solar and Elasticsearch has. You can index most of your um, data into that and give instant results without going up to the server. And also remember that local storage is your friend. You can use it for draft saving instead of saving them on the server. You can use it to cache results, to cache fonts. Use that. That's other way you can um, achieve performance. And I think that you know a wise man uh, once told me that the fastest request is no request. I mean, no matter how you optimize your servers, if you don't make a server request, that's going to be the fastest. Another way to achieve performance is to use specific performance. Sometimes you just can't improve the performance uh, of your servers or of, of your client. And you can use specific performance in order to fake it. Uh, I'll show you a quick example. So this is an example of an animation that happens on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. It takes exactly the same amount of time. I think that you guys can see that the right-hand side feels much faster. Uh, for us as users, it seems like, you know, clicking on a button, and then I see a nice animation, and the new content appears instantly. While on the left hand side, I click on a button, I see the slowly indicator going on, I know in my mind I'm feeling, okay, I'm waiting now, and then the new content appears. So this is one way you can use animation in order to, for the user to feel like this product is faster. Uh, again, I'll use Facebook as an example. When you load Facebook, I don't know if you guys noticed, it was changed just recently, you see this nice animation where you can see um, placeholders uh, for posts. So if I see that again, you can see there's an image over there. And the funny thing uh, was that I've asked several people and none of them noticed that 
you know, Facebook is rendering this image. To them, as users, it seems like Facebook is loading. It's loaded the text already, and it's just waiting for the images to load. This is an amazing effect. It feels like the website is loaded in a matter of milliseconds, and then you're just waiting for some graphics to appear. And uh, Rotem, which is our designer, she's done a, a, a cool experiment for me. And basically, we try to see how Facebook will feel like if they use a load indicator instead of using this technique. So, again, left, left hand side and right hand side, it's the same amount of time, only that instead of preloading um, those articles, we show a load indicator uh, on the screen. And you must agree that the right hand side feels much, much slower. See that again? Yeah. Okay. One cool thing that came out of my presentation is that you know I've been working at, on it in the, in the last several weeks, and basically internally we started to think about what we can do, what we can take from this presentation and implement that in our product as well. So uh, Tala, one of our developers, he saw uh, my slides and basically. He then went and tried to optimize our product. So this was up until a few days ago. You can see that this is how our product looks like. It's a board. And when you click on a board, we used to have a loading indicator on the left hand side. And then we changed it. That's a few days ago. Uh, they will show the, uh, the items, which we call pulses, and show placeholders, and then just render them once we get the server response. And the results were amazing. We got our customers sending us emails saying, wow, you really improved the performance, although we didn't do anything. <laughs> All we've done is render a few uh, lines of HTML, and, but it just feels great, you know? Um, think about the user clicks on board, you already see what he knows. He doesn't, he doesn't see your loading indicator. You see pulses, you see the colors, you see the name of the groups. This brings a great feeling for the user. So you, this other method uh, uh, to achieve uh, performance, you can use, what I've mentioned is gradual UI loading. You can use also the progress bars, but give me, give me a favor, do me a favor. Don't use progress bars that start fast and then become slow. Use progress bars that start slow and then becomes really fast. And use all kind of effects on buttons. Use over effects, active effects. Large.js is a great library uh, to give indication of something that's going on in the server. And use animations. Uh, but use them carefully because us as you know, we all love CSS. We know all the, some some stuff is really easy to do with CSS, like active effects and other effects on buttons. Some of us are overusing it, adding too many animation, making animations too slow. You know that's a good way to shoot yourself in the foot as well. Use short but sweet animations uh, for your user interface. One. Case study I want to share with you guys is uh, something that happened to us, you know, real life event in the polls. So, as I mentioned, we are, when we created our product initially, this is how we imagine it will look like. You know, you develop something and then uh, you, you have some kind of a use case in your mind how it's going to work. So, this is how we imagine it. It's going to have several pulses, uh, which, which are the lines you can see. It's going to have four or five columns, and you know, users are going to use it and enjoy, etc., etc. And then after we launched this product, like a few weeks later, we got complaints from users saying, wow, your product is really slow, it's not working fast enough, I can't use it because it's slow. And then, uh, you know, we tested it again, it's working fine, what's going on? So we asked our users to send us any videos or screenshots of uh, what happened to them, and we got stuff like that. Wow. So people... I won't say abuse, but use a product in ways we, we didn't imagine. They created hundreds of books, they created 15 columns. And when we tried to recreate this on our product, and we saw that, yeah, I mean, if you create so many columns, if you create so many items, that's going to be slow. So we sat down and we thought, what we can do in order to improve that? So we tried several stuff. One thing we've done is to load the HTML first and then go out to the server and get the result, what you just saw. And it's improved the performance a bit, but again, you, know, you still have to wait for the server. And then once you render the boards, it will slow to scroll. Another thing we've done is to do client page uh, pagination. So instead of rendering the whole board, we rendered the first 20 pulses. As, as the user scrolled, we rendered another 20 pulses, and so on and so on. But once the user scrolled down enough, the board was really heavy and it started to be slow again. 
And another thing we try is to use the GPU. Because as, as I said, in order to move the board to the GPU was a bad decision because the board was really heavy with HTML. And we got uh, people saying, wow, my browser crashed, he crashed my Firefox, and so on. So we said, OK, not a good idea. Some computers doesn't handle this well. I think one of the things that made the most difference is that we reduced the, HTML, the amount of HTML elements. Uh, we went through, as you can see on our book, we got a lot of repeatable elements, a lot of elements we render over and over again. And we tried to reduce the number of HTML elements to the minimum we can do. And this improved the performance, but still, I mean, we have some fancy stuff going on inside our product, it still wasn't enough. I think the thing that made the most difference is that we use gradual rendering. Basically, what we've done is that we thought, what's the minimum, like really the minimum we need in order to render the board? And then we thought about enhancing the board uh, according to what the user does. I'll show you a uh, video of what we have in the IC. So this is Firefox 3D view. This is how the board is rendered initially. You can see that every element here, every cell, has only two or three HTML elements. But once the users start to interact with the board, and you can see all the fancy stuff in the corner, and the blue sign, and so on, and there's a lot of other stuff going on, we render the rest of the HTML. So you can see in the video that we render all kinds of other stuff that we need to do uh, in the client. So think about it. We got a board with thousands of pulses, a lot of columns. Probably the, the user is going to interact with 5%, 2%, 10% of the board. And then we can render the fancy stuff only for the relevant uh, places. So if I'll give you five takeaways you can take from this presentation and apply in your day to day is that, first of all, Boom performance equals user happiness. Use that. Improve the performance of the product. It's going to benefit you in ways you can't imagine. Don't skip the basic optimization uh, stuff. I know it's boring. It's, it's the server, guys. It's not us. But you need to do that. Uh, use the CDN. Minimize, uh, minify your JS and CSS stuff. And always think that unless you might wait for the server, don't wait for it. Think about features that you develop, stuff you can do in the UI. Most of the stuff you guys do, you can do on the client. And try to fetch the data just before the user needs it. Think about how you can track the users, how you can preload content to your browser before, just before the user needs it. And always remember, if you can't make it, fake it. Use specific performance in order to achieve a feeling of a trusted product. So thank you very much, and always remember